Today's episode, you guys, is brought to you by Perfect Storm Real Estate Specific Software. It's the website I use in my business. Um, I'm actually a partial owner within the company that's been able to give my input to help create a piece of software that is uber, uber effective at lead generation or real estate businesses. Uh, that website, www.perfectstormnow.com. Go check that out. It's amazing, epic front-end lead generation site that's extremely affordable for real estate agents out there. Also, today's episode is brought to you by our 90-Day Mastery Boot Camp. Um, if you're in the real estate industry, if you're wanting to take your business to the next level, this is an, a gnarly, crazy experience. Uh, we go through for 90 days straight. There's about 13, not about, there is 13 total sessions that we go through each weekly session. Session is about two to three hours long every single week. Um, plus, you have daily access to me going through the experience uh, through the group. So, to check out more about that program, we roll those out about every uh, about every ninety days. That we, we stagger them once in a while, but we do about three or four of those every single year. You know, so if you want to spend uh, uh, the next ninety days with me, about forty hours of, of just crazy epic content, helping your business take it to the next level, go to www90 daymastery.com uh, that's our sales page you can see testimonials and learn more about the product and, and register and sign up right there if you are signing up make sure to use the promo code live mastery all caps all together all one word live mastery it saves you 500 bucks and makes that whole entire 90 day coaching experience only 997 dollars for you guys so all right let's jump on in What is up, my friends? Joshua Smith here with another GSD interview, where we interview top entrepreneurs and just people that are out there doing big things in this world, that are dominating their space, that refuse to live a life of mediocrity and go out there and create what they want to create. So today, you guys, we have an amazing guy on the show. This guy has done a lot of things in the real estate industry, but also owns and operates multiple other businesses. Uh, Very, very successful entrepreneur. So I'm really stoked and honored to have on the show, Bill Jenkins. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks, Joshua. Well, glad to be here. Yeah, no, this is awesome, man. So before we get into what you're doing today, um, you know, because I know you've got a lot going on, multiple businesses, very, very successful. But before we jump into that, let's kind of rewind the clocks. How, how did you get started in entrepreneurship? Like, how did this journey begin? Well, that's a great question. And it really got started way before I was ever, you know, uh, into maybe entrepreneurship, but uh, into uh, being basically a self-employed person and having that mindset of being self-employed. Uh, I was a professional musician for 35 years, uh, and played. I was I played guitar, sang, and and uh, gained a pretty good level of success. I worked with uh, well, about 20 to 25 different stars. Some most people may not recognize, but you know some people are like you know Captain and Tennille, uh, Bill Cosby, Debbie Reynolds, Donald O'Connor, on and on and on and on. And so I. Uh, uh, did that and uh, for you know 35 years uh, and uh, so what I learned from being you know a professional musician is that you have to uh, basically you have to take control you have to take control a level of, uh, of accountability and responsibility for your own actions if you want to be successful at whatever you do and so uh, you know basically what I how I reached the level of success that I was at so that I was, that I was on a Tonight Show and Solid Gold and other TV shows like that is uh, I, I practice my ass off I mean I practice every single day anywhere from four to six hours a day and uh, my secret weapon was I was too stupid to quit I was just persistent and and uh, refused to give up and uh, there was a certain point uh, in my life where all of a sudden I started I started getting it I started getting it, and what I discovered later is that I was reaching that level of mastery, which is required. Uh, I think it's about a hundred thousand hours of practice until you reach a level of mastery. We have unconscious competence, and I finally reached that level in music. And so when I cracked that level, then all of a sudden everything became easy. I didn't feel like I was a salmon swimming upstream anymore. But I, I wouldn't have arrived there without having that discipline of being in practice. So to make a long story short, my wife uh, had been in real estate. Uh, ten years prior to me getting into real estate, she talked. She, she tried to talk to me. And I said, "Hey, look, I love our arrangement just fine. We got the kids wired. I'm playing music at night. You're selling real estate during the day. Everything's copacetic, right?" So, uh, but at some point, I, I started looking at, you know, the music business and saying, "You know what? It, it might be time to make a change." And so, pretty much uh, you know, about eleven years ago, I got my real estate license and uh, quickly just utilized the same principles I utilized with music. I realized that you had to gain skills. And with those skills within this business, it required a minimum amount of practice every single day. And so basically, I just instituted the same type of work ethic 
and uh, same practices that I had with my music business with the real estate business and then things started happening for me fairly quickly. Um, I, uh, we, uh, uh, I actually talked my wife, she was in new home sales, I actually talked my wife into leaving new home sales which was a great position. She had a guaranteed salary, she was one of the top salespeople in the group. Uh, we had benefits and I actually talked her at, I'm quitting all that with three kids and saying, hey, let's go into a commission only business with no benefits, what do you say? She thought I was nuts, but I convinced her of doing that and, and uh, so we uh, uh, first six months in the business, I figured we better figure this out fairly quickly, so we joined a team and in the uh, first year of a, as a husband and wife team, and this is in 2005, uh, we were the top producing husband and wife team that first year in business and it was just using those principles and then we stepped away from the team and then we had an even better year. And in 2007, uh, the market shifted dramatically. And for people who had been in the business as long, you know, as, as we have, uh, it was pretty dramatic. It was kind of like, uh, who moved my cheese? And all of a sudden, uh, I discovered, you know what, I'm not all that smart. I thought I had it figured out. And it really, really kicked our butt that year. And so I figured out, you know, I better find a way to get my education up quickly so that we can adjust to whatever market conditions occur. And so. Uh, we moved from, uh, at that time we were with Prudential Americana Group, and we moved from Prudential Americana Group to Keller Williams, and then we started moving up in leadership positions within Keller Williams. Uh, both my wife and I were uh, you know, elected onto the uh, Agent Leadership Council, and within the six months, uh, from the, uh, the owners and operators hired me to be the team leader for the office, so my job was to recruit, 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 and so I did that for eight months, uh, ramped the uh, agent count up, and then, uh, and then, then our business started suffering because I was a rainmaker in the business. So I stepped down, went back into the business, started ramping that up again. And uh, then, about six months later, this wonderful opportunity came up, and I was offered the opportunity to interview to become a coach for Mike Ferry. Uh, so I went in, interviewed, and it was about a three or four step interview process. Had to screen through about 450 people. I was like the uh, in Las Vegas. I was the only guy that was actually hired to be a coach for Mike. And then I coached for Mike from January 2009 uh, to about almost the end of 2011. And during that time, I uh, made over 8,000 coaching calls. At my peak, I had 125 clients I was coaching. It was full time. It did five days a week, eight hours a day. Um, stepped down from that. I went back into business, uh, started ramping our business back up. And just with my wife and I in 2012, uh, with no assistance or anything, we ended up closing 65 transactions. And then, uh, then the rest has been pretty much just a steady progression towards where we have our results currently with our team. I did uh, briefly coach for his son, Tom Ferry, as well, too, because I was able to coach in a part-time position uh, in that aspect. And that's when I was uh, uh, coaching Chris as well and some other great agents that are out there. And I coached for Tom for about a year and a half. And then I got too busy with the other side businesses that I'll discuss with you later, uh, along with my own business, and stepped down uh, with, with Tom after coaching for about a year and a half. So that pretty much sums up, encapsulized everything from point A to point B of what I did. And uh, everything's just been a uh, learning and growing process since then. But we've, we've uh, quickly ramped things, I think, in a short amount of time that we've been in real estate up to where we're at as far as our, our success. But uh, it's there's no secret bullet to it other than a lot of hard work and focus and you know figuring out what, what do I do wrong how do we correct it and let's let's do it a different way yep I love it so, so your market is very similar to Phoenix right so Vegas and Phoenix are identical and I got licensed 2005 same time that you got licensed and the yep. market was was taking off then it crashed extremely hard and 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 then that recovered and um, one thing that most real estate agents had a very difficult time with is those transitions. Going from okay, I'm a traditional real estate agent, adapting into maybe REO short sale, but then we saw a lot of these top REO and short sale agents that couldn't then adapt back into traditional when that went away. And you know, you guys have done a very, very great job at adapting through every single market shift, which most people couldn't. There's very few high producing agents that I know that have been able to make all those transitions. What, what were some of the things that you think attributed to allowing you guys to make those adaptations to those marketplaces? Yeah, that's a great question. And it was something that I wasn't aware of because it, when, when it first happened to me the first time, Joshua, I was blindsided. I didn't know what was going on. And what I, what I discovered is that I didn't really know my market. You know, and by knowing my market, I didn't know what the inventory was. I didn't know what the sales were. I didn't know what the pennings or contingents. I didn't know what type of market it was. And so and, until I realized, it's, it's kind of like a store owner not knowing what inventory he has in a store. 
I mean, how are you going to replace what's missing, you know, what's, what's already sold or what's not moving unless you know your inventory? And so I became a student of uh, my inventory. And so that, uh, and, and I continue to do that. In fact, I put out a, a monthly market report every single month and, uh, and I kind of split it up according to uh, price bands because I, I believe that uh, every single price band in a market is a different market. Uh, you know, there's uh, the, the media sometimes has a tendency to paint broad paint strokes, saying, "Well, hey, we're in an up market, we're in a down market." Well, that's not necessarily so. I mean, if you're uh, dealing with uh, upper upper end properties that are you know one, two, three, and four million dollars, that's a buyer's market. If you're dealing with properties up to three hundred thousand dollars, that's an extreme seller's market. So you've got two markets simultaneously that are going on. So it's important to know, you know, what price point are you in, what price point are you focusing on, and what type of market is it. And it's all and it's all based on supply and demand. If there is an overabundance of supply and not enough demand, you know what happens to price? It goes down. If there's a, a scarcity of supply and overabundance of uh, demand, what happens to price? It goes up. So it's understanding that, and I think that uh, probably has a lot to do with being able to adjust to market conditions. And you know, when you really got your uh, you know ear to the ground, you can sense it. You know, within a week. Or less. I mean, you can you can feel it. You can feel you can feel shifts, especially when you start becoming a lot more active, and you'll start noticing it. And uh, and plus, the other thing too that helps is you know masterminding with uh, other agents in other markets, uh, just to, to get a, a pulse or a sense or a feel uh, where their markets at versus where our markets at. And of course, like you said, Josh, our, our markets really parallel each other. Yours is far larger than ours, but at the same time, it, it does they do parallel each other. Yep. So. You know, so you were a coach with uh, with Mike Ferry and Tom Ferry. Um, when you're building your business, did you build it with kind of those bottom line up front, hardcore prospecting tactics that Mike Ferry teaches? Is that how you built your business? Is that how you're still continuing to grow your business? Yes. I mean, actually, I've taken components of Mike and uh, look, the, the things that Mike coach and teach are still pertinent and relative today. Uh, we're, for the life of me, I can't figure out why most agents think that they sh once they get their license that business should come their way. We're sales people. If you're in any other sales industry or in a sales job, uh, you would have a requirement on a daily basis of daily prospecting and if you didn't do that, uh, you're fired. So for the life of me, it, 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 it kind of confused me why agents wouldn't take the same philosophy that they're sales people. It's almost like it's a dirty word. So yes, as far as uh, Mike's philosophy of actually going out there and getting the business, that's very much a component of our business. Now, what we've done is over time, because I've done it for so long, I figured out that, you know what, why am I doing this when I can coach and train other people to do it for me? This way I could focus on just going on appointments and then how many more appointments I'm going to be able to go on to do that. And how I came to that epiphany is that when I was coaching for Mike, one half of the floor of his, his building is his salespeople. So Mike's not on the phone prospecting. He's got salespeople. He's delegating salespeople that are doing the prospecting for him. So I said, hey, you know, if it's good, for, good enough for Mike, it's good enough for me, right? Yeah. Right. So then it's just a question of, all right, is it duplicatable and is it scalable? And uh, we could talk a little bit more about that later. But anyway, the, the, the first step was this, is that, yes, I did all of my prospecting on my own. And, uh, and I was diligent about it. You know, a minimum of two to three hours a day, every single day. And uh, I, I don't think there's any substitute for that if you're trying to, you know, uh, duplicate that with outside services if you've never been in the trenches and done it yourself. So, yeah, that's a big component of our business. Another component is obviously working in our database uh, because we want to make sure that every single experience we have uh, with, uh, with an escrow, whether it's a buyer or seller, that at the end of it, they become raving fans and it, and it creates future business for us. So we're huge proponents of constantly staying in touch with our database and, and feeding our database and growing that as well. So to do the amount of business that you guys have, have, are doing and have done, but also to run simultaneously other side businesses that are very successful, you've got to have some great systems in place. You know, kind of talk to us about what your systems look like and maybe what are a couple of like your favorite systems that you're using right now in 2015. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there's. Uh, I use as far as for uh, you know, uh, I'll give an example for systems for generating seller leads and going after seller leads. Uh, what I've done is I've uh, uh, trained uh, uh, virtual assistants in the Philippines to do all my outbound calling for me, and basically they call eight hours a day, five days a week, 
four weeks, you know, um, you know, um, every single month. And uh, what I've been able to do to, to them is that they, they've actually, on average, set close to about 40 appointments. So it's a combination of phone, phone appointments and physical appointments for me a month. And those are all primarily expireds, FISBOs, make me moves, or Z buyers. So that's that's the key thing that I focus on on the on the buy side. Uh, I have a uh, a Real Geeks website that I've had since the fall of 2011 when I stepped out from coaching with Mike, and uh, that generates you know, anywhere from you know uh, 40 to 50 leads a month. With that, that's more than enough to feed buyers agents. Uh, and so, uh, and within within that system. I also use Infusionsoft, so there's specific campaigns that I use that are, are for buyers, for sellers, for expireds. Uh, we're also uh, Dave Ramsey endorsed local providers, so we also have campaigns for those as well too. So we have a lot of different lead sources, and uh, you know I've learned from you know people that are far more successful than I am that it's it really comes down to it's not eliminating lead sources as you go as things change. It's adding additional lead sources and having assistance in place. So we definitely have specific systems in place for buyers. Every single buyer that we meet with, uh, they have to have to do three things. They have to meet with us in the office, just like you would any other professional, a doctor or a lawyer. And by the way, I have this conversation when I meet with sellers too. Um, and so they meet with us in the office for initial consultation. During that initial consultation, number two is that we uh, uh, ask them a series of questions to find out, number one, if they have the motivation, and number two, if they have the means. So if they're paying cash, we have to see proof of funds. If they're financing, we have to see a loan approval letter, but we don't stop there. They also have to do a backup with one of our preferred lenders. Not to circumvent their lender, just to make sure in case something goes south at the 12th hour, we've got a backup plan. And then lastly, every single one of our uh, buyer leads has to sign a buyer broker agreement with us, what we call a loyalty agreement, because we feel if we're gonna focus 100% of our time and energy and expertise on helping them, all we expect is the same commitment to return, which we think is fair. Yeah, yep. absolutely. So, you know, what we see today is is leads aren't always a problem. It's agents' inability to convert those leads to appointments that's a problem. You know, you're getting all these real geek leads and all these other leads, um, right. but if we don't know how to follow up properly to convert them, they become irrelevant. What, what, are, you, what are you guys doing as a team? I mean, how, how much frequency are you following up? How quickly are you following up? What, what does that look like today? I'm glad you brought that up because that is, that is key. Uh, and, and I, I think the the buzzword now is not agents aren't aren't having challenges generating leads like you said. It's the challenge of converting the leads, and the conversion is all in the follow up. Um, all of my VAs and myself, my team, we've got a, a big banner. Well, I wouldn't say a big banner, but we have something that's in front of their workplace that simply states this: eighty percent of all of your business is converted will happen between the fifth and twelfth follow up. So if you're not following up between five and twelve times minimum, you're you're missing out on eighty percent of the business potentially you can convert. Uh, we use Follow Up Boss, which I love, and uh, all all the agents that are assigned to that, I can see you know whether they're active, whether they're actually being accountable and doing their job, and so we use that as an additional tool for accountability. Uh, but the key is this: I mean, it's, there's no holy grail or magic bullet or secret weapon. It's the consistency with the follow up. And the key with the follow-up is, you know, following up, coming from a place of contribution. What can I do to help you? It's not coming from a place of I'm desperate and I've got commission breath, you know, I'm spewing it all over you. It's, you're going to turn people off. So, and I think the, that's the biggest challenge for people is, I think the reason they don't follow up, number one, is they don't know what to say. And, uh, and number two, they feel like they're going to be bothering somebody. But I would challenge anybody out there, you know, to think about this. Whoever they're going to choose as an agent, do you think it's going to be the person that followed up with them the most or the least? Right. right. So if you if you want to uh, allow more of us to have more business, then stop following up. Yep. Love it, man. Love it. So the fortune's in the follow-up. No, no truer saying in sales than that, right? So, um, uh, okay, so but now you're, you're operating other businesses in addition to your real estate business. You know, what, how, how did that take place? I mean, how did, how did you make the transition? What inspired you to start building these other businesses and what are they? Great, great question. Um, and it, it kind of happened serendipitously. Uh, I was interviewed on a, a couple of uh, uh, Keeping It Real uh, video or Google Hangout videos uh, last year from uh, Frank Clevitz from Viral Marketing and also Jeff Manson uh, from Real Geeks. 
they and uh, the interview I think it was last summer around June or July. But the the topic was is how I hired a VA that sets forty appointments for me a month. Um, and so they did an hour interview with me, and I went over in detail with scripts exactly what I do. And pardon the pun, it went viral. I mean, it's had over ten thousand views on it. And then we did a follow up one in December of that same year on how I convert the appoint phone appointments into physical appointments and the physical appointments into listings taken. It was it was kind of the tie in with with the prior one. So. What happened, Joshua, is that after I did those two, I kept getting calls from agents all over the United States. Hey, Bill, I saw your interview, man. It blew me away. I, you know, uh, Can I pick your brain? Yada, yada, yada. And so after I started, keep, kept receiving these calls, I went, you know what? I mean, I, I'd love to help all these people, but I can't, you know, piecemealing it you know, one at a time. And I said, what can I do to create a service? And obviously a service that's going to have value for agents out there, but it's also going to make sense for us as well, too. So, um, what I did is I talked uh, uh, talk to my uh, lead virtual assistant you know, in the Philippines about it, and I said, look, this is my idea as far as putting something together, because I know there's other services out there that do outbound calling services. There's, there's a lot of them. But I said, I, I haven't seen any of them yet that focus specifically on converting expires and for, ships, for sale by owners, make me moves, Z buyers. In other words, real specific seller low-hanging fruit type leads. I see a lot of services that are calling for, you know, nurtures and long-term nurtures and like that. But I said, first of all, my question was this with her. I said, could we duplicate this with other agents? And if we can, is it scalable? You know, because if as more people sign on, are we going to have you know the manpower that's going to be able to do it? And so we we tested it out first, and uh, and this is fairly recent, by the way. We just actually rolled out this service uh, in May. Uh, so in June, uh, I did actually I did 11 Skype interviews with uh, individual VAs, and we kind of whittled it down to about eight or nine. Um, and so we tested it out and had them basically just do all the outbound calling after uh, an intensive uh, two-week training, which is pretty much modeled what I what I trained with my lead VA over the years with. And we've got it condensed now where we've got a got a system and a formula on how to do that. So in June, they set a combined eight appointments for me. I mean, it just literally kicked my ass. And, and so I knew at that point, okay, it's duplicatable. Now, is it duplicatable in different markets? Well, that was kind of an untested thing. I mean, we, we weren't going to know. You know, you don't know what you don't know until you start testing it in different markets. So uh, as we started hiring, you know, clients that were signing on and taking on people. So we've got people that are kind of like in resort markets. We've got people in markets similar to ours, uh, people that are in high-end markets. And so I was saying, no. What about some markets? Because look, there are some markets where they're, they're just not expires. They're just not there. So what do we do in those markets so that there's still going to bring value? And so what we've been able to do is come to terms with that, uh, with our clients. And uh, uh, basically, we've got it, got it wired in. And so I can share with you my initial clients that signed up at within two months, every single one of them now has taken listings from one of our outbound VAs set in appointments for them. Yep, love it. So, what, what does that what does that look like? I mean, is that a you know a monthly fee for? You know, I, mean, I mean, our yeah. listener base. I mean, fifty percent of our listeners right now are, are realtors from all over the United States, all over Canada. Um, so, so what does that look like? Right, exactly. Not a great question. Yeah, it is a monthly fee, and uh, and what it entails is this. And by the way, the uh, uh, the site, if they want to check it out and get more information, is myvasteam.com. My Vast Team, and, and the, comp the, the name of the company is Vast, which stands for Virtual Appointment Setting Team, but it's myvasteam.com. Um, basically, the, the deal is this, and what I've learned, Joshua, is from coaching these agents, what they're going to do and what they're not going to do, and I just simply know that just from after 8,000 calls, uh, and it is, simple, it is what it is. I mean, you can fight it or try to battle or try to change them, but rather than doing that, uh, I figured, let, let me create a service that's going to feed the need of what they're going to do. And so basically, what we do is uh, they're assigned their own virtual assistant. We pay for their salaries. We pay for their training. We also have uh, my lead VA is also acting now more in a capacity of a manager for all the VAs so they're held accountable. Okay, We pay for all of the lead sources, all of the dialers. And in addition to that, I also give uh, a one-hour group coaching call every Friday uh, to all of our clients because I knew this. I, I said, 
the, the thing that's going to make or break this business is not setting the appointments for them. I know I can train VAs to set appointments for agents. It's the agents converting that into business and paychecks. And so I, I knew the missing component was what I need to do is just train them and coach them to show them exactly what I do on a day-in and day-out basis. And by the way, I still do this myself. So this is not in theory. This is in practice. And uh, so I, uh, what I found is that I think with, with, with a lot of the clients, they really look forward to those calls. Because what we can do is we can kind of dial in and hammer out what were the challenges you had, what were the things you were saying that was causing you not to convert that appointment or you know close that listing. And what I what I know is this is that over time, once you learn at least two to three answers to every single thing you're going to hear, you're never going to be surprised by it. You're going to start converting business, and that's when we started noticing that uh, they started taking listings within that time. Because this is the good news, the. Buyers and sellers out there, they don't have a secret mastermind group where they're coming up with different things to trip us up every month. Right, right. It's, it's the same stuff. So come up with two to three answers. If you already know you're going to hear that, you know, me memorize and focus and practice two to three answers of what you're going to say. And the more you do that, the more it's going to sound natural and it's going to sound conversational. So uh, with all of those things tied together as far as the uh, group coaching, uh, paying for the VAs, paying for the lead services and everything, uh, the service is $2,500 a month with a four ninety five dollars setup fee. Which is it's not a junk fee. It's used to set up because we have to pay for lead sources up front, you know, to get them set up. Uh, typically, the setup time for anybody is anywhere from five to fourteen days, depending on you know where they're at in their market. But uh, uh, we just had a, a person sign up in New York. We had him up and running in about five days, and he and he already got appointments uh, this past Monday already that he went on. So first day, first day out, boom, appointments. He was going. Uh, it was it's kind of interesting because he, he was saying, uh, okay, what do I do to convert this? I said, look, we'll get to that. Trust me, there's going to be more of these coming your way, a lot more of these. So just, just go on the appointments, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll get it all focused and dialed in. But uh, we also have a, a private Facebook group, and within that private Facebook group is uh, all of the recorded calls, coaching calls for every single week, and also all of the scripts that we use for our clients. And so they've got that as a resource. They get the coaching for a resource. And uh, and it's a, it's a it's a minimum of a six month commitment because I know this when I first started doing this and testing it out for myself, I, Joshua, I don't know if it was going to work for me. Right. I mean, it was kind of an unproven thing when I was about four years ago. I was thinking, will this actually work? And trust me, on the, the the first few months when I went out, I sucked. I would, I mean, I went out. I had, I was like floundering. You know, I went out there and my first physical appointment. I walked to the house. And I took pictures and walked out and went. Okay, that sucked. What can I do better next time? And so after going on, you know, 50, 60, 70 appointments, it started, it started transitioning into a system that's pretty seamless. And I, I know for a fact it works every single time. Yeah, and yeah, it's, I mean, it's really a steal. I mean, if you look at it, you close one listing a month that's a $300,000 listing, pay $2,500 to bank nine grand. That's a pretty, pretty darn good ROI. It is, and it, it, it starts. It really starts monetizing, and this is what I discovered with my own VA. It really started monetizing for me after about four to five months, and then after that, then it really started ramping up. Because the better you get, obviously, then the more listings you take, the more more uh, deals that you close. Uh, and the great thing about this too is that, and something that uh, I didn't consider, but I started realizing it with my own business is that with some of these expires and fizzbos, they've got friends that have houses. And so some of these deals that I've closed that was from one appointment has led to four or five deals. So you have, you have to take that into account too because, I mean, we, we had one FISBO that ended up having four family members that wanted to sell. We ended up listing all their homes and selling their homes too, and that was from one appointment. Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah. All right, so, you know, when, when, we're, when we're in business, well, not just business but life, yeah. those, those failures that we have, and I hate the word failure because they're really our best learning experiences that – become our greatest assets and truly define us. What are maybe some of those best learning experiences that you've had going through all of this that have really defined who you are today? Uh, it, it goes back to my music career. Because I had, I had tr uh, tons of, look, if I, if I could count on how many times people said, boy, you suck, you're, you're, you know, you're not, you're, I mean, there's, there's always gonna be people out there devaluing you. If you buy into that, then you're giving them power to devalue you. Uh, the, 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 I think that if I can give the best advice is protecting your mindset and just trusting in the fact that 
my mindset is this, and I, and I coach this on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't use the word failure. I, I, my philosophy is this. Look, if it didn't go your way, you're either earning or you're learning. So if you didn't make money, what did you learn from it? So when you take that mindset and that philosophy, uh, what can I learn from this experience versus, oh, whoa, what was me, man? I got shot down again. Or something happened or it felt, you know, it's like all, all you're doing is you're pulling yourself down a path that's not going to serve you. So my philosophy is this, is stay focused on, look, you're either earning or you're learning. Yep. So I, my philosophy is that, you know, it's like you can just determine whether or not you want to call it a bad experience or a failure or a learning experience that you're going to grow and learn from. So you talk about protecting your mindset. We, you know, we live in this world of just massive, massive amounts of negativity. I, I call it the mediocrity vortex that just exists in society. What, what do you do to protect that mindset, man, when, when so very few people have that same mindset that you do? Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's a great question. There's actually a system to protect your mindset. And uh, one of the simplest systems is uh, writing down what you're grateful for before you go to sleep. And when you get up, what you're grateful for to learn the next day. And if you do those two things, and also, you know, don't watch the news before you go to sleep. You know, because it's, it's just negativity, negativity and crap. You know, feed your mind with something positive before you go to sleep. Because now what you're doing is you're feeding, you know, your uh, you know, Napoleon Hill. said, look, your mind's like a, a, a field. You can plant beautiful flowers. You can plant nightshade. And they'll both grow. It's up to you to decide what you're going to plant. So, you know, before you go to sleep, don't put the news on. Read something that's uplifting or challenging or inspiring and use that to feed your subconscious. Uh, and before you go to sleep, write down you know the three things that you're grateful for that you learned from that day. It could have been something that you know you it, it, it kicked you in the ass, but what were you grateful for that you learned from it? So when you get into the habit of doing that on a daily basis, gradually what you're going to do is you're going to be educating and training your mind to think in a different way, and thinking more in a uh, in a way of like, look, I'm just I'm a learning machine. Because, look, you never stop learning until you die. Because if you stop learning, you stop growing, you actually re regress. You don't stay where you're at. You fall behind. So that's one, that's one of the ways I would do it. I'd be before you go to sleep and also when you get up, write down what you're grateful for. You know, set up your day. Now, in the course of the day, we're, we're all going to have those moments of crisis. Now, the best questions you can start feeding yourself when you have those moments of crisis is this. And here's a great question you could get in the habit of asking yourself. And I ask, trust me, I had these multiple times in the course of a day. Uh, and this is w one of the misnomers that I thought when I was early on in this business is that I figured, wow, once you get more successful, you don't have to deal with as much shit. Wrong. You deal with twice as much, if not quadruple. It's how you deal with that that defines you and makes you and grows your business. So when you reach those moments of crisis, it's the questions you ask of yourself. So if you have something that's a crisis point versus going down that pity, pity pit, ask this question. Okay, I know what it is I don't want. What is it I do want? I know what it is I don't want. What is it I do want? And when you start asking that question of yourself at that crisis point, you're going to take yourself out of crisis mode and put yourself in solution mode. Does that make sense? Yep. No, I love it. Love it. So what does self-development look like to you on a daily basis? Uh, Self-development for me is, is, is look, my, hey, look, I'm 63. When I get up, that's a positive. <laughs> you know, my dad died when he was 64. So uh, for me, every single day is a gift. So, uh, and, and it's great. The way I've got my life designed right now, we go on a lot of vacations. Uh, every single morning I get up or the night before when I go to sleep, I'm looking at the next day, and I already know what my schedule's mapped out for me because I've got, I've got uh, delegated and trained people to map it out for me. So the only thing I do on a daily basis is basically, you know, get up, go to the gym, you know, do a light workout, come back, shower and get ready for the day and start going to the appointments. And literally, all I do, literally, I only do two things. I go on appointments and I follow up. That's all I do. I don't do any of my outbound prospecting anymore. I mean, I don't count follow up as outbound prospecting. I'm talking about cold, cold calling. And really, it's not even cold calling when you think about it because if, uh, if you're calling around listings and sales, that's cold calling. If you're calling an expired FISBO, make me moves, Z bar, that's not cold calling. You're responding to somebody's inquiry. So, 
you know, you've got three kids, you're married, you're in yeah. a husband wife team, you know, right? So a lot of thing, a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with is, Hey, I'm, I'm to be successful at work. Then that means I'm less successful as a parent. And, you know, a lot of people have a, that, that a really tough time finding that balance. You know, what are maybe some of those things that you've done where, you know, you, you keep the relationship great with your wife, even though that you guys work together every single day and with your kids, making sure that you're not neglecting those truly important things in our lives. Right, absolutely. And that's, uh, that's extremely important to me. And that's one of the reasons, too, that I decided to, you know, shift careers because uh, uh, at that time I wanted to make sure that I was there for the kids, you know. Uh, but, but how we do that in, um, is really being clear on defining our roles, where, where her strengths are, where my strengths are. And uh, we, we didn't do that at the beginning of our real estate career. We were actually doing the opposite, and there, were, there was a lot of conflict and I think a lot of it, Joshua, is because we didn't understand um, we didn't understand personality styles. We didn't know what they were, or uh, understand it. So we didn't know the difference between a driver, expressive, amiable, uh, analytical. And before you know who you are, how are you going to be able to adapt to somebody else unless you know who what, who they are? And conversely, if, if they don't know who they are, so uh, learning. Personality styles, learning that you know my wife's a high expressor, she's a high I, trailing D. I'm a high D, trailing I. Um, understanding that uh, went a long way towards you know uh, strengthening our relationship. And I, I say this is a running joke. I said, you know, probably for the first 18 years of our marriage, you know, we've been married 30 years. Uh, I was just naturally pissing off my wife, and I don't know why. Uh, I was just, I was just being me. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, but I was going, geez, I, I, these women are mysterious. I, I don't get it. But then when I look back on it, I go, well, f dummy, yeah, I, I completely understand why you're doing that. So it's understanding um, understanding who you are, recognizing people around you, and then eliminating your ego to adapt around your surroundings. And so what I understand a personality style about every single one of my kids. And so when I communicate with them, I communicate with them you know, according to their style. Now, it's not manipulative. It's actually respectful. And so when you say, you know, uh, it's important, you know, to make sure that, you know, you're uh, there for your kids, that's been one of the most important things we did. We never sacrificed that. I mean, my oldest son now is 24, so he's, he's got his own life, and my middle son's autistic, so we'll always be caregivers for him, and we'll always be there for him as well, too. But my youngest son is 16. He's extremely active. And so, I mean, we've got to, you know, sometimes, most of the time we're like cab drivers taking him to wrestling, to debate. Uh, to uh, best buddies, school functions like that. So that's that's very very important to us. And the only way you can have that balance is to have leverage, to have some great people uh, on your team that allow you that leverage. And we're fortunate. We've got you know we've got, we've got a great uh, office manager, sales manager, and who holds down the fort for us. We've got a great marketing director, and then of course I've got my outside staff as well too. So uh, it, it, it'd be really tough to do it as a solo agent. Uh, the only way I, I feel that you can do it well is with leverage and the right kind of leverage. Yep, awesome, love it. Um, so a couple last questions for you, but before we jump into those, I, I just want to make sure that our listener base knows how to get a hold of you. If they have specific questions, if they want to learn more about your VA company, if they want to you know, maybe just inquire about coaching with you, whatever that may be, how do, how do our listener base learn more about you, Bill? How do they get in touch with you and get a hold of you? Well, if they want to find out a little bit more about the, uh, uh, the BAST business, uh, if they just go to myvasteam.com uh, and just, just log in and they can send a request, that's how I've you know, spoken for the last uh, couple of clients that have signed up and reached out to me. So that's one of the ways too. Um, one of the other ways, if you want to reach out to me, is uh, you know you can call me on my cell, seven zero two eight four five eight five four zero. If I don't answer, it's because I'm on an appointment. But I, I promise you, I'll at least get back to you that day. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So, all right, what do you do? You know, good good becomes the worst enemy to greatness. It's very easy to get into this trap of, oh, it's good enough, and, and quit pushing to take it to that next level. What are some of the things that you do to continue with, with goal setting and in your life just to continue that you're not selling for good and you continue leveling up? Uh, right. That's, and that's a tough one, too, because it is easy to get complacent. It is easy to sort of like take your foot off the gas, especially this time of year. I know a lot of agents, you know, they check out right after Halloween, and they're done until like January, February, and go, oh, I guess I should maybe put together a business plan. Um, and that, that's why I love this time of year, 
because I, what I'm noticing is when I'm going on appointments, I don't have as much competition because everybody's already checked out. So, but to answer your question specifically, um, we we put specific goals up on our whiteboard. We have it in our office, and we do it do that on a quarterly basis. I'm in coaching as well too, and my coach, you know, holds us accountable and drives us forward and knows what we have too. So I, I think it's very very important that you have somebody there that's holding you accountable. Uh, and and first and uh, one number two is that uh, you have to understand. Why are you doing what you're doing? What's your why? If you don't know what that is, it's it's going to be you're going to be really hard pressed to get yourself out of bed and go beyond what you would ordinarily be be able to do. So you've got to figure out what your why is. Uh, and at that point, once you do figure that out, then have specific goals uh, up on a whiteboard and have people around you to hold you accountable. I mean, you know, spouse, family members, uh, other agents, maybe your uh, maybe your broker at your office. But as the more people you have holding you accountable, the more likely you are to accomplish those goals. Because I, I know this, and I'm sure you do, Joshua, I'm preaching to the choir, is um, there's two types of accountability. There's internal and external. And the vast majority of people just don't do that well internal accountability. Yep. Right? There's a select few that do, uh, but they're rare. The majority of the people function best when they have some type of external accountability. So if you don't have that, don't have a why, then you're probably just going to be floundering. And life's too short and too precious to be doing that. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is life. Yep. All right. So let's just say something happens, man. You get, you get financially wiped out. You're having to start from scratch. Your, your health is good. Family is good. You know, kids are good. All that's, all that's great. Um, but you have little to no resources, let's say 500 bucks, but you retained all the knowledge over all these years of, of your entrepreneurial experiences and just life experiences. Um, so you've retained all that knowledge. What are the first few things that you go out there and start redoing immediately to rebuild this empire that you built? Well, the first thing I would do is I would, uh, you know, uh, it's free. Is I'd get on the phone and I'd start doing what I've delegated. And I would, I'd get on the phone and my focus would be this. I need to go on two appointments today. And I would stay on the phones until I reach that goal. And if, if I didn't reach that goal, I'd take a lunch break and come back in the afternoon. Because if, if, you, if you don't have any appointments set up, what else would you be doing? Yep. So, I mean, it, it's pretty simple. I would, be, uh, I would be focusing on going on appointments and, and scheduling something uh, via the phone or even, I wasn't that big of a door knocker, but I could do it. I would do whatever it takes to, to get something going and happening uh, because I know the alternative is, you know, I, I don't want to be on a, on a, on a corner and I, this would never happen to me. Uh, I don't want to say never, but God forbid, but I don't want to be one of those people on the side of the road with a cardboard sign saying, please help me, you know, when I know I can help myself. And uh, using your scenario, with all the things that I know, I am supremely confident I can ramp the business back up fairly quickly. It's not like I'd be starting from scratch. Yeah, you, you know, you never start back at zero, right? No, no, no. I love it. So, you know, this podcast is really designed to go out there and, and, and we're in an industry, especially the real estate industry, where there's more information available than any other industry out there with the least performing people. And, and I wanted to go out there and start interviewing the doers like yourself. You know, instead of, you know, we got a lot of coaches and consultants that have never even done this before, right? And, and not saying there's, that's good or bad, but there's a lot of information that, that is theory. It's not practical information from somebody like you that's actually doing it, that's in the trenches, that's not speaking from a place of theory. Um, what are some, some maybe last words of advice or inspiration you'd like to leave our clients, or our, I'm sorry, our, our, our guests with? Um, to go out there and create the success that you've created in your life? Great question. So the first thing I would do, and this is what I did, is uh, seek out people that are highly, highly successful and find out what they're doing and model them. I mean, I, I learned that from Tony Robbins 30 years ago. Uh, you know, if you want to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible, and you're a D, I'm a D, you know, we don't screw around. We want to get results yesterday. Go after the people that are successful, not in theory, in practice, that are doing this on a day-to-day -day basis and do whatever it takes to get in front of them and shadow them and figure out what they're doing. And at that point, then you, you go back and emulate what they're doing. And then once you start doing that and, and growing your business, then it, your business is going to take on your own personality. 
But that'd be the quickest way to get yourself off the ground and doing that. I mean, that's why with my wife and I, I don't know anything about this business. What can we do right now to earn income quickly? So I figured, let's pick one of the top producing teams, join their team. So I interviewed the team, we got on their team. So if, if you're kind of floundering, nothing's happening, uh, pick out some great teams that are in your marketplace, interview, and go on the teams and watch, watch how they work. Love it, love it. Powerful words, man. Uh, to our listener base, I know I end every podcast with this, you guys, but information without implementation is the start to delusion. Information is not power. It's taking that information, executing on it, that then creates power in your world. So you guys heard from a rock star today that's uh, not just a rock star real estate agent, but but an entrepreneur in many different assets that's went out there and created some massive success. So take something that you learned today. Take a few nuggets, go out there and implement, execute immediately in your business. And Bill, man, this has been an absolute honor having you on the show, man. I've, I've learned a lot. I know our listeners will learn a lot and, and uh, greatly, greatly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to be here. Thank you so much, Joshua. And listen to everybody out there. I hope this has got some value for you because what I've learned is this, is that the more value uh, that you create and put out for you, it comes back to you tenfold. So uh, blessings to everybody out there. We wish everybody the massive success that you all deserve. Just open yourself up to it and it will come to you. Yep, awesome. Love it. All right, you guys, we will see you next time.